Retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Ray Morris, thank you very much for joining us. And you spent 27 years in the Army, a good number of those in Special Forces, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But, and then you've also, uh, you've written uh, several books. One of them is the Ether Zone U.S. Special Forces Detachment B-52 Project Delta. And so I've, I've, I've gone through that book, and, and I think we'll, we'll spend uh, time talking about some of your own experiences in the Vietnam War. But to get us started, just tell us how you got into the Army in the first place, when you got into the Army in the first place, why you got into the Army, et cetera. How did you, you know, get into the Army to begin with? Uh, well, you might say that we're a military family. Uh, most of my uncles and cousins spent time in the military and would return home on leave, and I watched that as I grew up. Mm -hmm. And it just always uh, uh, was in my mind that that's a direction I would like to go. I think one of the first books I ever read was Audie Murphy's To Hell and Back. Oh, right, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, uh, that was kind of a thing that started – me thinking about the military and then later on uh, the patriotism thing kicked in and uh, mm. and uh, all of my uncles and cousins coming back and and telling their stories of their travels and so forth so yeah uh, that really piqued my interest and and then I wanted to uh, finish a college education and I didn't come from a wealthy family so I wanted to finish my education yeah. uh, and and that's what I did when I came out. I picked up two master's degrees in the military, by the way, and yeah. and uh, so I achieved that goal at yeah. least. Yeah, yeah. When you now you you mentioned the the patriotism, uh, the sense of patriotism. Uh, Vietnam veterans sometimes say that this was really encouraged by uh, President Kennedy's very stirring inaugural address, you know, the famous ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Do you remember, if not that specific speech, do you remember just sort of the spirit of that remark, you know, being something that was around in the 60s, you know? I, your I, I do. I remember that speech very well, and uh, I remember it sent kind of chills up my back. All right, yeah. Hi. Wow. Yeah. What, what year did you actually go into the Army then? Uh, March the thirty uh, first, uh, nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixty. Oh, okay. And his inaugural address was January nineteen sixty. So you went in not not long after. No, I, 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 now January nineteen sixty six. I went to Vietnam. Oh, um, all right. Okay. Oh no, and I just I just made a mistake. His inaugural address was January. 1961. He was elected in 60. But you go, you go into the army in March of 1960. I went, uh, yes. And uh, I went in with the idea that I'd stay in for two years and get out. So you went in enlisted initially? Yes. Uh, I, I was an NCO before I went to uh, officer's candidate school. Okay. So I was an E6. You were an E6? Uh, I, watched, oh. uh, uh, I watched the speech. Uh, I went back home. Did some talking to my parents and uh, talked to some of my relatives, you know, and, yeah. and I said, I think I want to stay in. Really? So that, so, all right, so just we have the chronology correct then. You go in and you, you enlist in the Army March 60. Uh, President Kennedy is elected later that year. He gives the famous inaugural speech in January 6, it's January 61. And, and you're saying that the message of that speech is actually something that encouraged you to, to say, I'm going to stay in the yeah, army. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, oh. And by the way, he is, uh, he is one of the guys I highly admire and respect because, you yeah. know, on special forces, he was the guy that awarded our parades. Yeah. Oh, oh, so yes. Yeah, talk a little bit about that, the, the relationship between Kennedy and army special forces. Uh, Kennedy didn't know that much about Special Forces until he was invited down by uh, General Yarborough to Fort Bragg. And we had what was called the Gabriel Demonstration, which was a Special Forces A-team yeah. would come out on a stage and they would 
outline, these are my skills and here's what I do. And then it put on demonstrations of hand-to-hand -hand combat and repelling and the sky hook and all of that. And, and, it, and they did that for a while for dignitaries coming from foreign countries um, to tell them what our capabilities are. And, and I guess we were pitching training their soldiers in our skills to be able to fight the communists. Right. Yeah. So he was invited down. He attended one of those. And when he left, he had told General Yarborough, now we'd been where we, I say at the time I had, wasn't in special forces, but our yeah. uh, special forces was wearing the beret secretly, unauthorized mm. every time they got the chance. But yeah. he told General Yarborough that, uh, from this day on, I'm going to sign an uh, executive order authorizing your guys to wear the Green Beret. It's a wow. symbol of excellence. Yeah. Wow. And so the, the Green Beret is very much uh, attached uh, to, uh, to President Kennedy. Tell us about your own transition from enlisted to officer and then your, you know, getting into special forces. So first, just... What, tell us a little bit about your transition from, because you got pretty high enlisted, you know, E6 is, is pretty high. I, I did, I did really well, very lucky. Uh, I spent almost four years as enlisted, or, well, four years as enlisted. I was in the 101st Airborne Division. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in the 101st Air, I was infantryman, uh, but rank came pretty fast if you worked hard enough. Mm. And uh uh, yeah, E6 and four I was a, I wanted, made up my mind I was going to be a career man anyway, so I did work hard, and I went to yeah. uh, the NCO Academy, then at the NCO Academy, I made honor graduate of school, so when I came back, they gave me another stripe, <laughs> so, so that's yeah. how I made, my first stripe was what was yeah. called a blood stripe in mm -hmm. those days, and it was when I was a specialist for uh, one of the guys went downtown and got in trouble, and they busted him, a uh, buck sergeant. And mm -hmm. so the the uh, thing in those days was to keep that stripe in the unit. Uh, I see. So they they didn't have to wait for Department of the Army or anybody to uh, give right. you that stripe. If, if the right. guy got busted, they could keep the stripe. So that was a blood stripe, and that was my buck sergeant stripe. And then when oh, I came I back from the NCO Academy, and I did well there. Then I was promoted to E6. Yeah. And so uh, I spent that time in 101st Airborne Division, and then I applied for OCS. You did? Okay. And uh, uh, you got in. Yeah, and, and that's how I ended up in Special Forces. Uh, in OCS, uh, I made uh, a distinguished graduate in OCS, and um, the special forces personnel came to Fort Benning and that their, their um, plan was to pick up the top graduates out of each graduating class yeah. and try to get them to go into special forces. And so when they talked to me, I said, sure, why not? You know, the, yeah. so the top three, I was uh, the honor graduate, the number one guy in the class, I was number two, distinguished graduate was Charlie Q. Williams. And Charlie Q. Williams went on to win the Medal of Honor in Vietnam. Wow, wow, wow. Let me, just another kind of professional question, and then we'll, we'll get into, um, you know, the topic of Vietnam itself. Do you think that being prior, not only prior enlisted, but prior enlisted, you know, I mean, you know, E1 to E6, it, it, pretty quickly, but still you experienced that transition from E1 to E6. Do you think that gave you an advantage later as an officer, having experienced that? Uh, absolutely. Role? And this was not, I, I wasn't unique because most of the officers, most of the, not most of the officers, but most of the lieutenants assigned to special forces had prior enlisted. They yeah. weren't green lieutenants. I mean, uh, mm. they went in as uh people who had experience, you know. Well, so you, you hear about the dumb lieutenants, you know, you put them out on point, and hope they get shot because they make wrong decisions. That's not our problem in Special Forces. That's, that's the guys knew that Yeah, <clears throat> this lieutenant was probably my rank when he went to OCS, you know, so mm -hmm. they at least listened to him. 
Yeah, and and what just as a just sort of as a practical thing in a typical day, what what advantage did that give you knowing what it was like to be an E three, knowing what it was like to be an E four? I think it gave me a tremendous advantage, uh, and it helped me much later on in my career because I could relate to the enlisted grades very well. I knew their problems. Yeah, I knew what made them tick. Mm. because I'd been there. I knew how they viewed the higher commands because I'd been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, it was uh, very beneficial to me. And, and I had good rapport with all of my enlisted personnel. In fact, I'm still friends with many of them. They live, yeah. some of them live with just a few blocks of me here. With wow, fishing, yeah. Fishing buddies. Yeah. And, and as uh, I can't tell you a little story that I was, uh, uh, while I was writing my book, I lived up in Washington State, and the phone rang, and uh, the, the guy on the other end said, uh, is this Colonel Morris? And I said, uh, well, I'm retired. And he said, well, you don't even really remember me. But he said, when I was a spec four, he said, you gave me a break. He said, mm-hmm. you could have sent me to jail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he gave me a break. And he said, I'm on the sergeant major's list. Wow, wow, wow. I didn't even know him. <laughs> That's great, wow, yeah. Uh-huh, well that brings into my own mind a, a prior enlisted O2 when I was in the Navy. Um, I did something really stupid, and <laughs> I won't tell you what it was, but I could have gotten into a lot of trouble, uh, but this prior enlisted O2, he understood, and uh, he handled it perfectly. And um, I learned my lesson, but didn't get everything that I could have gotten because he understood the situation. So I think I can identify with what, uh, with what that enlisted soldier was, was right. saying. You, well, you, you can it. spot the troublemakers. Yeah. You can spot the good soldier potential in the good soldiers, you know, and that's what you go with. Yeah. You go into the Army in 1960. In 1960, Vietnam hardly anybody's paying attention to Vietnam. I mean, you know, it's if it's in the newspapers at all, it's way back on page A10 or something like that. Um, you get to Vietnam in 66, by which time now, of course, it's more and more on the, on the front page of the newspaper. Do you remember the first time when Vietnam came into your consciousness? You know, when did when did you realize there's something over in the ground that I might I might get involved? I in? think it really. I, I was aware of it. I, I, I've always been someone that likes to keep up on the current events. Yeah. Uh, but but I I never paid much attention to it until I got into uh, special forces, which was in 1964. It was when I was assigned to special forces. Yeah, and I started meeting these guys who had been there. They'd been to Laos. In fact, one of the guys in my uh, team had been a POW in Laos. Um, uh, a guy named Waters uh, was a first sergeant. Uh, but they talked a lot about Vietnam, and of course, uh, a lot of the people would come up on orders and be shipped out to go replace people on in first special forces group on Okinawa, which was doing the TDY thing to Vietnam. Yeah. And so that, that become very uh, important to us to, yeah. uh, to know that what was going on over there because we figured sooner or later, eventually we're all gonna end up there. Is this like 64, 64, or would it be what, 65, 66, when, when you're hearing these special forces guys talking about that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, 64 is when I arrived in in uh, uh, at Fort Bragg in Special Forces. And at that time, it, everybody talking about Vietnam. That was Vietnam and Laos, yeah. that, was the, that was the hot spot. That's the place that people yeah. were gearing up to go. Because at that time, if I remember correctly, Special Forces were very much involved in training South Vietnamese and training local forces, right, to... You know, because Kennedy, President they Kennedy, were doing that among other things. That, yeah. There was a lot of things going on over there. Uh, uh, they were primarily under the uh, auspicious of, of the CIA in those days uh, well, for a yeah. lot of operations. 
let's let's transition to that and and there may be some things that you're not you know you're not allowed to talk about but to the to the extent that you can talk about it you just mentioned CIA operations and my understanding is that you were involved in some in in a CIA operation related to training Laotian forces is that is that right and are you able to tell us a little bit about that uh, I, I, yeah, I can talk about it to uh, some because uh, I think a lot of it's been declassified. I, if, if some of it, I, you know, I, I'm not even going to go into because it, it goes without saying that uh, uh, everybody at, at this time knows we did a cross-the-border operation. Yeah. When I was in Thailand, uh, one of the camps was set up and ran by the CIA, and I a team was hand selected and I was fortunate enough to be one of them. In fact, I was the commander of the team, uh, was assigned to that program and we worked directly for the CIA. We were, we wore civilian clothes. We didn't wear uniforms. We took a, uh, uh, absence from the military entirely. We got our paycheck. Did you let your hair grow and all that too? And uh, any, uh, we wore civilian clothes, however we wanted to dress, that was okay. Um, we had priority orders. We could go anywhere we wanted to. Probably bump anybody off the aircraft to get on. <laughs> you know, it, I mean, it, it was it was kind of had its perks. It was a it was a good assignment. Yeah, and we answered directly to the the CIA. Uh, wow. Uh, a chief in charge. His name was Harry Monk. I think Harry died. Now he he's passed on. Yeah. Uh, the top guy over there at the time. Um, and I don't think it's classified any longer. It was a retired general named George Morton. And so these are the two guys that we answered to. Uh, what we would do is we would train uh, commandos uh, and then they would be inserted back into the plane of jars and uh, they'd run operations and, and then they would some of them would return and brief us and, and they would train more, you know. These, so were, these were Laotian commandos? Laotians, yes. And they were, and where were they doing their operations? You just mentioned? In, uh, on the plane, mainly around the Plain of Jars area. Uh, uh, they were doing interdiction, ambush, uh, that type of stuff. And they were, they were interdicting the uh, supply lines of the long trains coming out of China that were coming down through Laos at, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and then into Vietnam. So, yeah, okay. So now I'm, I've, I, I hate to reveal my ignorance here, but I've, the plane of jars, I, I've heard of it, but I can't remember where it is. It's That's in Laos. In, it's yeah. in Laos itself, okay. So, so they're not, they're, these forces are not crossing into Vietnam. No. No, these okay, forces so aren't going to Vietnam. They're in Laos. They're trying to interdict the Chinese supplied uh, coming down lines that were coming down through Laos, and then they would hit Vietnam farther down, uh, what we call the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which yeah. actually is, is a misnomer because the, it's not a trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail is hundreds of trails. Right, yeah. You know, that, that's yeah. filtered in through across the border. Sort of this ongoing year after year effort to shut that thing down and, you know. Yeah, it was, well, it's like trying to put your thumb in the dike to, uh, you know, hold back yeah. some of it. When you were doing this operation with the CIA, uh, I mean, and, you know, somebody asked you, somebody in your family asked you, so, you know, what are you up to? Uh, what would you say? I was in, in Thailand training ties. That's, that's okay. all. Training ties. That's yeah. all we, we talked about. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we don't, yeah. but, uh, other than that we were training Laotians, that's as far as you want to go into it with anybody, you know. Yeah, yeah. These Laotians you were training, um, what what were they what what were they fighting for? I mean, you know, were, were they fighting just for a paycheck, or was there some ideological thing? Like, what's motivating these guys to fight? I, I probably a little bit of all of it. You know, uh, 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 many of them had been really screwed over, you know, by the communists um, in their own country. Uh, you know, they yeah. they'd lost family members, they had lost their property and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And so they really had a chip on their shoulders. Some mm -hmm. of them were just in it for the money. We paid really well. 
Yeah. <laughs> And how, how would you characterize these? Now, these are commandos, so they're probably in a you know, different category. But we often hear about South Vietnamese forces on the whole, or maybe not, not so dependable. How would you characterize these Laotian commandos you worked with in terms of dependability, in terms of skill? The ones we trained that went over did a really decent job for us. And, um, and, and the reason that we know that is because on uh, every operation, we would issue them what these little cameras called pen double E cameras are only, you know, two or three inches wide. Oh, yeah. And we'd say, take lots of pictures, you know. Mm. And uh, so we had a, had one come back and brief us, one of the lieutenants. <clears throat> and uh, he told us that they ambushed this huge convoy. And he said they, they knocked out dozens of trucks and, with supplies and blew them up. And, Everybody sitting there and rolling their eyes, you know, mm. and like, yeah, sure you did, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it, it, he said, well, he said, I wanted to prove that we did this. So I took pictures and he gave us all these pictures. Wow. He and did it. Wow. Wow. And this is 64, 65? 66? Uh, no, this is later. This was uh, okay. after I had my first tour in Vietnam. Right. Okay. Well, that's and, right. and I would say it was probably 68, maybe. Yeah. I, it sticks in my mind. Let me yeah. have to think about it. 68, 69. I see. Okay. So later on. That's right. Because you went to Vietnam. Uh, on 66 the first time. In 66. And, and then I think in 68, uh, I was in Thailand. 68, 69, I was in Thailand. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, later I went to first group on Okinawa and from there went TDY back to Vietnam. Back to Vietnam. That so, was the early 70s. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about your, we'll, we'll return to your tour in Vietnam you're in 66. But you mentioned that in, in Thailand you're training these Laotian commandos. But then also what really catches my attention is that I believe you're also involved in the training of Thai special forces as well. And I've, I don't think I've ever talked to any veteran who had a direct relationship with, with Thai forces. I don't think most Americans even know that we had Thai allies with us in South Vietnam. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit yeah. about your work with the Sure, the sure. Uh, uh, that was when I was at, uh, assigned to Thailand, that was the reason I was assigned to Thailand, was to train the Black Panther Brigade, be part of that. It was called the Expe Thai Expeditionary Force. Mm. And uh, we were all Special Forces personnel. Mm -hmm. We were assigned at the bridge on the River Kwai. You've probably heard of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that was our location. And uh, the Black Panther Brigade was, uh, they were really good troops. They were very good troops. Hmm. Uh, in fact, after they were trained and sent to Vietnam, we sent some folks over there, and I went over there uh, once also, and we got to spend some time seeing how they operate on the ground. But we were told that the, uh, the uh, enemy forces said they didn't want to fight the Thais hmm. because they were too brutal. Hmm. Really? Uh, yeah. yeah. They said they kill everybody. That they don't take any prisoners. They just kill everybody. So that was that was a good thing, really. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, if you, it's a tough war. I've heard the same thing about the South Koreans. I've heard the South Koreans were. And they're another force that was the same way. Yeah, I, I would equate the uh, Thai Black Panther Brigade to being somewhere like the South Koreans that we sent over because yeah. they were both really good troops. Now, were the Thai in South Vietnam, and this is, a, I, don't, I don't know the answer to this question, so far as you know, did they always have, I mean, were the Thai forces on their own? Did they have their own command structure, or were, were they always mixed in with America? No, they, they were on their own, but they fell under the, the, uh, the Supreme Command, you know, the American uh, command okay. in Vietnam, but they, they had their own commanders, own brigade commanders, their own division commander. Uh, they were given missions yeah. like everybody else, and they were part yeah. of the larger operations, but, yeah. but uh, they operated uh, their own way. 
Yeah. And we didn't we didn't have American advisors with them. That's the reason really? so, that we did send some back over just to see how they were doing to make sure that they, you know if there was any tweaks that we need to do, uh, we would have done it. But uh, yeah. they did very well. And if I remember correctly, you said that you were involved in the training of Thai LERPs, right? The Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol, is that right? That was part of that operation. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I trained, personally was responsible for training the uh, Long Range Reconnaissance people for the Black Panther Brigade. Yeah, so just for folks who don't know what, what LERPs did, and in this case we're speaking specifically of Thai LERPs, what was the, what was the mission of a, of a LERP? Long range reconnaissance. Well, uh, the units that are rather stationary on the ground or out running operations, they ran, they always run recon patrols, but those are local recon patrols. They'll go out for maybe a day reconnaissance, make sure, you know, sure you're not running into ambushes or uh, yeah. see if they're checking for enemy movement and so forth. The long range reconnaissance are, they're in no man's land. I mean, they're inserted out there in, in Indian country. Uh, they're operating on their own. Uh, they could be out there for a week or two at the time, even. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a very dangerous job. It's a, it's a elite, a prestigious job, if you want to call it a prestigious job, yeah, because yeah. the best troops are usually yeah. put in those type units. And with the Tylers, what I've heard from... American LERPs is that, you know, most of the time they weren't, they weren't supposed to get into combat. They're just out gathering information. That's true. They're, they're, they're not fighting. big enough to actually do the fighting. Now, that, that didn't mean they didn't run into it and have to, you know. Yeah, yeah. But the idea is don't be found, don't be seen. Uh, if you are seen, you're probably compromised and we probably need to get you out. As I said in my book, Delta Project was, uh, they were probably the uh, epitome of long range reconnaissance, but they they did it with small three to five man teams and they yeah. go out for three to five days and, uh, mm -hmm. and they were deeply inserted into enemy territory entirely on their own. Uh, yeah. Call back for help or extraction if you, if you can, you know, that type of thing. Did, did you, in your, so you, you are in, you, you go to Vietnam several times on, on um, TDYs from uh, Okinawa and then also from Thailand, but then you, you have a tour, uh, is it a full year uh, in 66, um, Special Forces. Did you yourself, um, were you yourself on LERP patrols? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Later on, uh, well, I would say the last part of my 1966 assignment, I was assigned to a unit called the Mobile Guerrilla Force. The Mobile uh, Guerrilla Force? Mobile Guerrilla Force. Yeah. It was a brand new concept. We took the first one out that went out in Vietnam, and I understand there were several that went out after that then. Mm. But we were the prototype. And... Uh, I guess the best way to equate the mobile guerrilla force is to think of like something like Merrill's Marauders uh, in World War II. Oh, mm. so you're you're uh, you're not a small force uh, where you can sneak and peek so much, but you're not a force that can stand toe to toe with the NBA uh, brigade and slug it out either. Right. So, yeah. uh, I had the uh, I was the recon platoon leader of the long range reconnaissance patrol for the mobile guerrilla force. Yeah. And uh, these were hand selected uh, from all the teams that people were. So I was fortunate enough to be one of them. Um, I had four Americans and about 20 Cohoe Mountain Yard. And these guys were very experienced. Um, they had seen combat. They were, they were good troops. And what we did is we went in before the main body, two or three days before the main body, and we'd recon the area, make sure that they weren't coming into a hot LZ. We'd secure the LZ, and then we'd set up for them, and the, the main body would come in, and then we would go ahead uh, and move out ahead of them. We were always about a day ahead of the main body. Okay. We moved 
far in advance of the main body. Our job was to make sure they didn't run into something that they couldn't handle. Yeah, yeah. And so now we uh, we went into the Ashall Valley, which is I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not, but yeah. if you wanted a gang fight, the Ashall Valley was the place that's to go. The, that's the place. It was the hottest area in Vietnam. Uh, is that either is that southern I Corps or northern two Corps? It's I Corps, I Corps, yeah, so southern I Corps. Yeah, and uh, in fact, we buried four guys out there and had to go back and get them later. Uh, our job, you know, we had to move. We moved from the north end of Ashaw Valley all the way down to the south end of the Ashaw Valley, and we were in there thirty days. So we didn't go out for three to five days like. A lot of the long range reconnaissance uh, patrols did. We went in for the duration. We were in there for 30 days. Wow. So even if you lost guys, they couldn't be extracted right away. You had we to... couldn't carry them. We couldn't, uh, the weather uh, was such that you couldn't get them out. Uh, we'll bury them and keep moving. And now we our... recorded those coordinates yeah. on the map. And, um, well, and I was in charge of the five-man team that went back in and got the bodies out just before I rotated. Wow. I, I recovered them. Well, that, that gets to a, a, another theme. You mentioned in, your, in the book that um, in, in, at the beginning of the book, you mentioned that there are, are 12, 12 um, uh, Special Forces members from the, the, the um uh, from the detachment B-52 that you write about, there are 12 still missing, at least as of the, the time the book was published. And then in the back of the book, you have the names listed and you put two stars by the by those who were still missing the time the book is published. Are you able to, do you have anything sort of at the front of your mind in relation to any of these missing, um, a name, a particular story related to any of these missing? Is there anything that, that you have? I'd have to there? look through my book now again and and, uh, and become familiar with who, those names, you know, because... Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I haven't... Um, I haven't heard that any of them have been recovered. Okay. I don't... Uh, I yeah. think I would have heard. Somebody would have told sure. me that. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, let me let me ask you this then. As a a veteran, you just mentioned. I mean, a, not just a veteran, but a, a combat veteran uh, involved in. I mean, in a variety of ways in in the conflict in Vietnam. Um, I recently had an experience with the um, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, and these are the folks who go out and look for the remains of the of the missing. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the most interesting stories I heard was a person from the DPAA who talked about being in Vietnam. They are looking for remains for five weeks. And in five weeks, they recovered one tooth and a medallion. But that was enough to identify that this was the person we're looking for, right? These, this tooth, this medallion, go, go with that. That, that, that person. And it was so interesting because the, the, the language is that, you know, of course the tooth and the medallion come home. And so in a sense, that soldier has come home, right? Um, I'm just wondering, you know, where your own mind goes with that or what your response is to that. Because of course, literally a tooth and a medallion are not a person, right? Um, but there is this idea that, no, we have something now from this guy, and so now he's home. Just how, do you, how does that resonate with you as a combat veteran, as someone who participated in, you know, you, just given the situation, you had to bury these guys, then you had to go get their remains, but then you mention in the book, you know, the projects you write about, 12 of these guys, their remains haven't been found. How do you resonate with that idea of, you know, of the country putting so much into finding what in reality is so little in terms of material, and yet it has such great meaning. What is your, how do you respond to that? Um, I guess, I guess I respond like 
something is better than nothing at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were able to get something. And uh, and I, now you interviewed uh, my old demo man, Lee Barnes, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Lee was on my team at where we went over, and he probably told you about his experience and what happened to his the team that we went over with. Yeah. Uh, when we got into country, for some reason, we had trained together for four or five months, the whole team. But for some reason, they took me and sent me to Bateau because they lost their XO out there, and it was a hot area, and they needed an XO. And so they sent me there, and they split me up from the team. So I wasn't with the team when they got ambushed and, and took such devastating casualties. Yeah. Where I'm going with this is um, Captain Fuel, the team leader, uh, was captured, apparently wounded, and tried to escape, and they uh, decapitated him. Mm. and separated it from his body and so forth. His head was all that was ever recovered. Uh, and one of the guys on the team escorted it back home. He got full military mm. honors. Uh, I don't think the family was ever told that, that, you know, that that's all that was there. The, the casket remained closed, of course, because it was months later. Sure. But yeah. We never found his body. Uh, I think they might have found some bones later. In the back of my mind, it, uh, I seem to remember something. But yeah. so, but had we never found it, had they never found the decapitated head, he would be an MIA, and yeah. there'd be no closure at all for the family. Yeah. There was news recently, and I'm just, I'm asking you about this, not because you're, you know, you're an expert in this field or a specialist, or even that you've, you know, that you've... No, by all that. means, I am not. <laughs> yeah. But, for example, there's a new, a recent news account uh, that the DPAA, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, had just found remains in Burma from World War II. When you, when you hear these kinds of stories that you know, remains from World War II veterans, from Korea veterans, from Vietnam veterans, that they decades later have been found and they're coming home. As a combat veteran yourself, do you have any, any kind of reaction to that? I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. I, I think if we can find anything that belonged to a, a veteran that gave his life, we need to bring him home. Bring them home. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. And thank, I, you know, I didn't, wasn't planning on going in that, that direction, but I, I appreciate that. Let me, I just have um, a, a few more uh, questions for you. So you've written this, but you've written several books, but the, the book I'm familiar with here is, is The Ether Zone, and the, the subtitle is The U.S. Army Special Forces Detachment B-52 Project Delta. Um, so obviously you were in special forces, you're involved in training, Laotian and Thai special forces. Um, many years you were in army special forces. Um, so it's, it's obvious kind of why you'd be interested in, in special forces. Um, but what was your motivation for actually sitting down and writing uh, a, you know, a fairly lengthy, lengthy book that takes a lot of, of time and energy. What was the, what was the motivation you, you had to actually? Well, um, I was asked to write the book by people in the organization. Oh, right. uh, uh, I, I knew a guy who had been spent some time in uh, Project Delta. His name was Gus Fabian. Gus has since passed away. Uh, and uh, Gus knew that I was an author published author, and uh, when he went to one of the Special Forces meetings, he opened the subject, you know, you know, before all of us die, we need to let people know what we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so mm -hmm. he said, I know, I know an author, uh, and I'm, I'll ask him if you want me to, if he'll write our book. And he's willing to come down and you can vet him ask him questions, 
talk to him but before he does to make sure he's not going to embarrass anybody. Right, yeah. Uh, and I did. Uh, I, I was a member of the same organizations, the Special Forces Association, the SOG, uh, Special Operations Association, all of those organizations. I, I knew most of these guys anyway. Mm. Uh, and so I went down, I did meet with the entire group, uh, answered questions. Um, uh, they said, okay, write it. And so um, now the most difficult part in writing this book is to getting people to talk. Right. I mean, you, right. it's hard to find special forces people that will talk about what they did mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, for some reason, you know, and uh, uh, even though you, you, they know you're writing a book, I, I had uh, a lot, some, the, all of these guys came forward that's in the book willingly and and i still have all the files and all the tape recorded uh, stuff we talked about every all the backup wow you know, so yeah. there's no uh, no mistakes or anything later where somebody said i didn't say that you know sure yeah uh, but it would have been so much better if i could have had more people come forward and talk to me and some people i would seek out and they didn't want to talk mm. Uh, so yeah, you didn't get all of the story, but you got a lot of it. You got a lot of it. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, to those veterans who are reluctant to share, um, I, I hope that, that they will in one way or another, uh, just, it's so important to get everyone's story down to one extent or another. I understand there's something. This, this book is project Delta's history, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, from a personal level i mean you, you know you can you can write a lot of data down um a lot of statistics down yeah maybe it reads like a phone book you know but yeah i tried to write it from on a personal level where people yeah sure get to know the people that did it uh see yeah. Them later. yeah and you, you you tell a lot of you know that yeah the book does revolve around a, a lot of a lot of the book revolves around the stories of individuals there's the one that really struck my attention. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Herb Swigsda or something like that. Shuska, yeah. Shuska, the guy who was basically impaled on a mass. He jumped off of the helicopter and was yeah. impaled on the punji stick. <laughs> so when I think of punji sticks, normally I think of something, you know, maybe about like that that goes through the boot. But this was actually. Well, they, well, they, would take, they would take punji sticks that were two, three, four feet tall and sharpen them and they put them on areas that they thought would be drop zones, landing zones for helicopters where troops were. And they knew that the helicopters would hover just over the elephant grass, which grew up three, four or five feet tall. Right. And the troops would jump out, at, you know, and, and skedaddle. So once they figured that out, they started putting punchy sticks in there and, and Herb just happened to hit one of them. And, and right I, to his groin and, uh, yeah. And it was it was, a, it was kind of a funny story, but it wasn't funny. <laughs> yeah, not funny at the time. Yeah. Uh, because if I remember correctly, one of his superiors is telling him, you know, get up here, get up here, and he's like, I can't move. I'm I'm impaled to this. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't move. Yeah, he was just stuck to the ground. Yeah. Wow, that's something. Yeah, so that that's that's just one example of the book that goes into a lot of um, individual stories. Now, to my knowledge, you haven't have you you haven't written your own memoir yet, though, have you? Like you mentioned, Lee no. Barnes and, and Lee has written his. No, memoir. I'll never do that. But so here's why I'm asking the why because you 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 know you've got your special forces stories, you've got your training the Laotians, you've got the training the Thais. I mean, this this is this is the stuff I actually I actually spent memoir. some time training Cambodians too <laughs> oh you did I didn't know that yeah there, I mean, was, a, there oh. was a there was a top secret uh, organization over there doing work it was called the FANK organization F-A-N-K yeah. yeah. and they trained Cambodian what we call KKK they were actually bandits Cambodian bandits mm -hmm. and so I, I was TDY out of Oki for some time doing that also so i had a lot of training experience on well, working with a ditch personnel so this is this sounds like a, just a memoir that has to be written so i, I really uh, I, I hope you'll i hope you'll think about that it uh 
I can't tell you how extremely difficult it would be to write about myself. <laughs> oh, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Well, I, I appreciate you 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 talking with me then. And also, um, you know, I, it would be wonderful if if the veterans um, who recorded their own memories with you, you know, if they would be up for. I mean, for those recordings to go into archives, um, you know, even projects like this where it can be made available to, to others. My own view is, you know, you can read the general histories. I'm reading a general history right now of Vietnam, but each individual story matters, you know. Yeah. Um, each individual story matters. You, you mentioned at near the end of your book that you returned to Vietnam in 2005. Um, in fact, let me, uh, let me see. Let me read to you just a, a sentence or two. I returned to Vietnam in the winter of 2005, essentially to research material for this book, and that is the Ether Zone, but perhaps also to search for the reason behind the price paid for it all. You say you visited Way, Marble Mountain, Da Nang, th those are all in i Corps, and then of Saigon, of course, down in the southern part of Old South, Old South Vietnam. You go to the Laotian border, the old special forces camps at Khe San, Lang Ve, et cetera. You went to the Kuchi tunnels, the Aisha Valley, et cetera. And, and so you, you, you go back in 2005 and, and visit a number of these places. What, what memories do you have of that trip in 2005? The Vietnam you saw in 2005, I'm sure, was very different from the Vietnam you saw in 1966, 68. 68, et cetera. Um, what, right. what, are your, what are your memories of that trip in 2005? Uh, <clears throat> we stayed at the uh, Garden Hotel. I think it was the Garden Hotel, the name of it. And uh, there's a very famous picture of uh, when they had a coup over there of all the tanks in a, in a town square. That was the Garden Hotel. It looked so much different in those days than it did in 2005. In fact, that entire area now is just like, uh, almost like downtown Chicago. In you know about Saigon? Uh, in uh, yeah, Saigon? In, in Saigon, yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's not a, a, a large part of Saigon, but it's that one particular area where the Australians and the Brits have come in and built new department stores. The department stores are rival Seoul, Korea, or, or Tokyo, or any of them. Yeah, yeah. But it's just a small, it's a part that they want Westerners to see. But we were able to get out in the countryside. Uh, I say we, uh, my, I took my wife with me, Brenda. Uh, she wanted to see where I'd been. Mm -hmm. And I went over there with a little Vietnamese who owned a uh, landscaping business in uh, Seattle, in, uh, up mm -hmm. in the Seattle area. And he uh, did a lot of work for us and we become friends. and. I spoke wow. a little Vietnamese yeah. and become bonded with him. So anyway, yeah. he he went with us and showed us around and, and, and kept us uh, uh, on the straight and narrow, you know, uh, as far as what, how to move around the country without being harassed yeah. too much. Sure. Uh, but when you got outside the cities, nothing has changed. Mm. Nothing. Uh, it's all it's all a big show. They, they found out that they were starving to death under communism. So they've allowed some capitalism in, into their culture now yeah. where people can own small businesses. They tax them like hell, but they can own small businesses. The government doesn't own them as they do in other communist countries. Yeah. But um, they only do that because they were starving and they wanted to bring in Westerners to invest and see what we're doing, and so and it's worked because there are there are Australians and Brits and some Americans who have come in and started investing in the country, but none of it is getting out to the people that mm. we know are new, mm. and and there still is primitive. The mountain yards are still living in straw shacks, mm -hmm. um, a very primitive, uh, still mistreated. Mm. Uh, yeah, so it's pretty sad. I, I don't know if I put it in my book or not, but I when we went to uh, Lang Bay, we went over to the border. There was a little uh, POW camp over there, and and I 
we ran into a mountain yard soldier. Did I, did I put that in my book or not? I can't remember. Yeah, I don't recall that. Uh, anyway, we were standing uh, in a crowd of Vietnamese and this very tall, slender mountain yard, he must have been in his 60s, looked very military. He had on his tiger fatigues, a beret, wow. and, and a little ribbon. Yeah. And he walked up to us and saluted. Really? And he said, were you in Vietnam? And I said, yes. Now, he didn't speak very good English. Very high in the accent, so he could tell he hadn't had a chance to use his English very much. Yeah. And, and he pointed at his brain and he said, special forces. Wow. And I said, well, I was special forces also. And then he pointed at the little ribbon. And he said, hmm. bravery. Wow. And it was, it was a, a good conduct ribbon. Wow, yeah, yeah. And, uh, wow. You can see that that's all they had to give him. Mm. Mm hmm. But he was still wearing that, and he identified you, and so there's that sense of connection still. Yeah. And when he walked up, the sea parted, and all the Vietnamese moved away from us. Moved away from us. We were. They didn't want anything to anything to do with him. Really? Wow. Wow. That's that's an amazing story. I've been in that area right there by Lang Bay and, and by the Laos. We, we, did not, we did not treat them well. We did not do them right. You mean by not sticking with them and just letting yeah. it fall in 75? Yeah. yeah. Mm. The mountain yard stuck with us. We did stick with them. Yeah, I hear that. I just read in the newspaper a few days ago that the USS aircraft carrier, is it the Roosevelt? Anyway, one of our carriers just recently paid a port visit to, I believe, Da Nang. Um, do you have any reactions to that when you see that, you know, that American Navy ships are now paying fairly regular port visits to Vietnam? Uh, it doesn't bother me. I think we need to open up dialogue. Uh, I mean, I don't hate the Vietnamese people. You know, I don't. I don't know many of that to do. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think we need to open up dialogue. Uh, uh, there were there were many. Uh, the old woman come up and grab my hand and says, "Ask me, were you in Vietnam?" Wow. And I said, yes. And she just held onto my hand. She said, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, when I was in Vietnam just a couple months ago, this was my third trip. I didn't plan to sit down and have conversations like this with Arvin veterans, uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And of course, we had to go through a translator. But every single one of them when the war was over, they had to go to re-education camps. Um, and, you know, they, you know, they experienced what happened when, when Vietnam fell to communism. And I think as you indicate, you know, the, the communist fantasy sounds wonderful so long as it's just words, but it gets put into effect and, and the misery skyrockets. You know? What makes us so sad is, if you recall in, in 2002, uh, General Bu Tin, who was a, he was a colonel who accepted the surrender in Saigon from the South Vietnamese Army. But he, when he was a general in 2002, he's retired. He's in bad health, and he held a, a short news conference in Paris. And he was very disillusioned with the communist government that he fought to install there. You know, mm. and he said that. Uh, the Tet, 1968 Tet Offensive was a huge mistake. It was a disaster. Mm. He said at the end of Tet, we were finished as a fighting force. Mm. But he said we knew that Jane Fonda had gone up north and made this picture, and it was causing a stir, and we would have decided to hang on and just to see what happened. And, of course, we were pulled out. 
So mm -hmm. you talk about snatching the feet from the jaws. the jaws of victory, you know. But that was the general in charge who said, and he said from his own words, we were defeated. We couldn't continue. So that's, I guess, what makes it so bitter. I Yeah, and so that, I, I have one last question. Uh, okay. well, I, I have in my mind one last question, but that leads to one that I want to ask before that one then. Yeah, I mean, all the numbers are that Tet was a catastrophic defeat for the Viet Cong. The government of North Vietnam assumed the masses of South Vietnam would rise up in support. That did not happen. It was a tremendous defeat. But yet it seems like, well, let me, let me just put it in the form of, of, a, of, a, of a question. After Tet, you have Walter Cronkite going on the news saying, you know, we're not winning, we're not losing, it's stalemate, we need to, you know, pull out, you know, in some honorable way. March 68, so just basically a month later, you know, a month and a half, something like that. Uh, Lyndon Johnson says he's not going to run for office again. It looks like the president is giving up. Did you, as, a, as an active duty, you know, special forces soldier, after Tet, could you almost feel that the that the country itself was 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 turning? I mean, could you feel it at the time that that even though the U.S. and South Vietnamese allies had actually gotten a significant military victory in Tet, that something had happened psychologically to the country as a result of Tet? Um, did, did you did you feel that at the time, or just what are your reflections on that as you look back at that? You know, Johnson, Cronkite, all that stuff. Uh, I don't remember feeling the pulse of the country as being given up, you know, as having given up. Yeah. What I, what I remember is everybody was thinking, oh my God, don't let them pull us out now. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Because it had been such a significant defeat. Yeah. Yeah. But if I remember correctly, the next year is when Vietnamization begins, right? 69 and the slow handing off of the war to the South Vietnamese. Last question. Um, let me put you in front of my students and you have two minutes to tell them what you think they should know about the, Viet the, the war in Vietnam. What do you think young people today should know about the war in Vietnam? What's the most important thing that they should know about the war in Vietnam? Uh, from my perspective only, the yeah. Vietnam War was probably a war we didn't need to fight. Uh, but we did. And since we did, we should have fought it in the manner in which we fought every other war we've ever fought in to win. Mm. Um, we didn't have the public support to do that. We didn't have the political support to do that. We definitely had the military might and the expertise to do it. And there's not a soldier over there that didn't feel like we're here, let's finish it and go home. Mm. Um, and my guess, the last thing I want to say on that is there's 58,000 names on that wall. Mm. And if we're going to do that. We needed to finish it. And we didn't. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And you, you, I'm sure you've been to the wall yourself in D.C. Uh, I've been to the traveling wall twice. And every time I do, I find myself looking up names. I haven't been able to go to the one on Washington. One in D.C., but the traveling one, yeah. Maybe someday, but yeah. not yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ray Morris, I, I, I hope you will uh, put your humility aside and consider writing that memoir. Um, but for now, thank you very much for, for taking this time, and thank you for the, 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 the one book of yours that I, I am familiar with, The Ether Zone. Thank you for writing that. Thank you for your other work. Thank you for your service to the country. 
And thank you for taking this time and sharing some of your memories. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. And I feel it's an honor that you invited me to talk to you. And I've enjoyed it very much, Preston. Thank you. Take care.